caught one when I was a kid. But my daddy drilled it in my head over and over and over and over and over again. What you follow, the two most powerful words in any language with, defines you. And they are creative words. And be careful every time you say, I am. Follow those words with who you are. Who are you? Well, here was the word that <laughs> popped into my head. I am here. And that, although that sounds sort of... So present? Yeah, well, I was going to say it sounds sort of cheesy, right? I am here. What does that actually mean? Does that have any real value? But that was what popped in my head when you just said that. We didn't, we didn't sit down and record yeah. any of this. You actually yeah. said to me, let's not talk for right. a minute before we start here. <laughs> um, but yeah, present. I am really trying in this crazy time that we live in that seemingly is getting crazier constantly. And then when you add the technological component where everything seems to be getting sped up faster and faster, where we used to talk about a 24-hour news cycle, now it's almost a minute-by-minute news cycle. The way we want to destroy people and things and institutions that have been with us forever, the way we want to just sort of ransack history and, and think that we can build everything new and as if you just have ideas today that have been born of nothingness and all of history was meaningless and all of these things, I really try to be present. I mean, even when I'm doing this, right? So you're interviewing me now. But I interviewed you earlier today, and we've done it a couple times mm -hmm. on each other's shows over the year, last couple of years. I really try to just sit in that room with that person and forget everything else. Now, you can't do it all the time because sometimes life just gets in the way. And, you know, there could be an, on, on any given morning. And it's fatiguing. Oh, Yeah. Oh, it's really, well, look, life is, life is tough, right? <laughs> life, you know, I'm on tour with Peterson. Life is, life is suffering. Life is not easy. There is no easy way out of this thing. You can, you can figure out ways, I think, to, to mitigate some of the madness and, and hopefully you can pilfer some happiness along the way and, and find someone or some people that you love and enjoy some good food and sex and whatever, whatever, whatever it is that makes you happy and play video games if that's what you want or play sports or read or whatever. But, but life is tough. And it, I think it's supposed to be tough. You know, I, I don't know what the, the real purpose is other than you have to find some, some use and utility for your own life. So I think if I figured out one thing, it's that I know that I wake up every day with a purpose. There is not a day at this point in my life, at 42 years old, after, you know, having all the 12 years of struggling as a stand-up comic and a couple radio shows and Sirius XM and being on the Young Turks and and personal struggles and being in the closet for a long time and, and a whole slew of things uh, that I wake up every day and the second the day starts, I'm like, there is so much to do. There will not be enough hours in the day. Um, you know, I still want to have time to walk my dog and, and just, you know, do some human things too. Um, but I think being present is the most important piece of that because that's where you'll find some honesty. And I think generally, I think what has sort of put me on the map with a lot of people is that I've been honest about my political evolution, my personal evolution. Um, you know, it's funny, I'm surrounded by this group of people. You know, I've got really the, the public intellectual of our time, Jordan Peterson, I'm on tour with him, right? And he's a clinical psychologist and best-selling author and all that. I've got Eric Weinstein, who's a world-renowned economist, and Brett Weinstein, who's an incredible biologist and Sam Harris, who's a neuroscientist and sort of the, the most outspoken atheist we have in a slew of other people. Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's, who's lived through more than, than any of us could of possibly bravest, imagine. One of the bravest people on the planet. You know, she absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right, but not only brave, she to me is the, is the, um, the, the marker for what side of things you're on. If, if I say Ayan Hirsi Ali to you mm -hmm. and you don't immediately say I love her or mm -hmm. I admire her, you know, maybe you don't know who she is, so I'll yeah. throw those people aside for mm -hmm. a second. But if, if there's a moment where you have to think about what you think of this woman, if you know who she is, you, you something is really whacked with your moral compass. She is. I've, I've interviewed presidents, prime ministers. I've interviewed everybody you could possibly think of. She is the only person that had a, uh, at the time, a Secret Service uh, man stand at the lens of the camera. Is she still that bad? Is it uh, still that bad I don't know that I can yeah, say okay. exactly what, but I can tell you that I've been at private 
homes yeah. with her where security, where no one could have possibly known yeah. where we were and security guards have to be outside. Yeah. But anyway, I'm surrounded by this level of incredible intellectual, um, deep, meaningful people who are, who are doing incredible things. And I feel very blessed by that. It's like oh, yeah. I, I'm I'm someone that's that's interviewing them usually, and now I'm I'm thought of as someone that's in this group with these people, and it's like, wow, what a what a freaking gift, yeah, that is. So I guess the somehow journal. I did something right along the way. Um, well, Twitter's the journal from hell, I yeah. suppose. <laughs> um, I don't journal enough, but I am writing. I'm finally writing my first book right now. What are you um, writing? So I don't want to give away too much at okay. the moment, but it has a lot to do with, I think, some of the things we're going to talk about here, a little bit about my political evolution, yeah. sort of the way I see the world sort of shaking out now and what really are the issues that we can't talk about and why can't we talk about them and how, if we're going to start talking about them, we can go ahead and do that. And really how I've been able to have these really tough conversations with a guy like Ben Shapiro, um, mm-hmm. you know, who will not only not bake me the cake, but said that he wouldn't even come into, if I had an anniversary party uh, for me and my husband, we've been married over three years, if I had an anniversary party, Ben said he probably wouldn't come. And yet I can consider this guy a friend. Now, he may not be a friend the way my true, my truest friends in in the most accepting, decent Uh way people that I go way back with are, but I don't need to make the world bend to my will. And I can find room for people that I think differently. And more importantly, and I said this to Ben when, when we got into this, and we both got a lot of hate for it, by the way. He got a lot of hate from people on the right that aren't happy with gay people, and I got a lot of people hate from people on the left that thought I was being a pushover or something to him. But I said, you know, Ben, hopefully we'll do this for another 50 years, and we can do it in public. You know, we'll do these conversations, and we'll mm-hmm. talk about these things. And I think I'll move you. I think when, when I'm 90 and he's a little younger than me, he's 80 or whatever it is, I think that over time I will have moved him on, on certain issues. Not that I want to change yeah, what say, his religious what beliefs <clears throat> are. Right. I don't. I don't want to change them. But I think that over the course, the only way we are going to get anywhere, period, in this world is by doing this. Will your relationship be worth it if you don't move him? Yeah, it would still be worth it. Of course, it has to be worth it, right? It's like, because uh, otherwise, what is it? What, yeah. what are otherwise, we, it's an agenda. It's it's an agenda, but it's also nothing. You will never engage with people who think differently than you. And we're we're, you know, as we just discussed on my show, it's like we are veering to that place in many respects. But I'm hopeful because of the amount of people I see in real life, not in 140 characters, but in real life who are trying to grapple with some of these issues, who are realizing in many cases that their allies are the same people they thought were their enemies a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the first time that we sat down, I said to you, I, I thought you were, I, I, was, I think, uh, I th- but a half genius, half crazy, half entertainer. And I know that's three halves, but there was a <laughs> lot going on there, right? And it's like, I don't know that five years ago I would have thought, wow, I can sit down with Glenn Beck and have no agenda other than, mm-hmm. you know, look each other in the eyes and figure it out. And uh, I think I'm a better person for that. And I, I just see no, you know, there's this idea that if you talk to somebody, that automatically means you endorse their ideas or you're giving air to whatever uh, thoughts they have that, you know, are untoward or something. And I just don't buy it. I don't believe it. And I'll keep fighting to make sure that that's not the world that we live in. It's really amazing that, I mean, because I, uh, I was invited to go to uh, interview um, Assad in Syria and turned it down because it had too many restrictions because I knew what he wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, he wanted me to tell his story. Yep. I'm not going to go into something. Um, and somebody asked me, well, you, you can't talk to him. I mean, what would you talk to? Would you talk to Hitler? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. would. I would. And I would ask honest questions. I wouldn't try to get him. I would just ask honest questions and let them hang themselves. You know, let them be exposed for who they are and speak honestly uh, uh, about it. I don't understand how... Um, I don't understand how me being friends with you you being friends with me or Ben or something, how that hurts us, how that, how that's your, even if we weren't friends, yeah. you being on my show, I'm not endorsing you. You're not endorsing me. I'm exploring. Yeah. 
Well, this shows how people have conflated people and ideas, right? So, of course, I mean, this is the most rudimentary, simple thing that people need to understand if we're going to function as a, as a society. You have to be able to talk about ideas and separate that from people. I mean, this is sort of the age-old thing about the, the artist and the art. Can you separate the art from the artist? And you're going to have all sorts of flawed people. They're going to have all sorts of flawed conversations and create all sorts of brilliant art and, and all Horrible. sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. And if we can't separate those two things, you'll never imagine if, if we couldn't do that. What, we're North Korea, I mean, or worse. I mean, we're really well, something worse. What, what kills me is the, that much of this now is coming from the left. Yeah. And you were the one that said, no, art should challenge you. You know, you go to a play, you, you read a book, you see a piece of art. It should challenge you. It should, it should push you maybe into uncomfortable places. Well, where is that now on something much more important? Ideas. Yeah. I mean, good art is an idea. Where is that? Yeah, it's so weird because, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like if I asked you to tell me your political journey, you can picture certain markers along yeah. the way, but it's really hard to truly remember what you were thinking at that time, really, right. really what you were thinking. So even though my journey has been been pretty quick in the last, let's say, three years, that's a pretty quick space to have a, a pretty big evolution, um, it's still hard to remember exactly what was going on. But I know that, look, I, w I was a lefty, I was a progressive, I always considered myself liberal, and I, I wasn't really one of the people that was always screaming racism and bigotry. I was, and I, I'm sure I did it more than I'd be mm. happy to remember, but I wasn't sort of full on in that. That being said, I was also, at the time, because so much of it was related to gay rights a couple of years ago, and marriage, and because that directly affected me, I think I did get caught up in it. So I think that that's partly... Uh, maybe I use that as, as a little bit of an excuse now, but I, I think that's a pretty honorable position in that all I wanted was equality. I wanted equality under the law, nothing more. And I think once, once everyone has equality under the law, which we have right now, well, then, then the rest is on you. It's a little bit of luck and it's a little bit of hard work or probably right. a lot of hard work and everything else. And you're still going to run into bad people. And there's going to be bad people, and there's going to be racists, and there's going to be bigots, mm -hmm. and there's going to be cheaters and liars mm -hmm. and stealers. And but there's also going to be great helpers and teachers, and sometimes those teachers are the bad guys. They don't know they're teaching, but they're teaching. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, Peterson, who I'm on this tour with, says all the time is that, that this is just an adventure. Make it your adventure. And I think if you really take that, you know, you really think about, like, what makes a great adventure? You know, like, you've got Darth Vader's helmet in there. Why is the adventure of Star Wars? Why is Luke's story an adventure? Why is Frodo going to uh, that wherever the hell he went? I'm more of a Star Wars guy. <laughs> 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 the mountain, whatever, yeah. Mount Doom or whatever. Um, wh Neo's adventure in the Matrix. Why do we care about stories? Because it's on you. The stories are what's giving us the map and this is where you can take this to a religious level if you want, but, but I don't think you have to only discuss it no. in a religious sense. It's on you in this world to figure something out and, and do something that's not easy. If you do something that's easy, I, I have a lot of friends right now who are, you know, I'm 42, so most of my friends are, you know, let's say within five years of that. A lot of them are sort of getting to this place where the rubber's meeting the road, where it's like, we're not young anymore in a tradition, you know, we're not... We're not in our 20s anymore. You know, we play basketball and it's a lot slower. And usually <laughs> someone has a career ending injury every week. And yet we're not we're not old. But like now our lives are ours, you know, and I'm what I'm finding is a lot of my friends who never really challenged themselves. They just kind of got a job that was relatively meaningless. Maybe they're married, but it wasn't the person that they were really supposed to be with. It was just somebody that was there sort of thing they're kind of having their midlife crisis right now, which I think is a little earlier maybe than a traditional midlife crisis would kick in. But I think this also goes to the things are speeding up and technology speeding up and the rate that we change and think is speeding up. And I'm not there because I, I have purpose every day and I feel like there's an adventure here. I'm about to go on uh, to, I think, eight countries in, in Europe in 16 days with Peterson and find out what all new people are thinking and, and have those conversations. And I get to go out there and talk to all kinds of people and they tell me all sorts of things and, and they're, they're all different. 
and that that's incredible. But but to the earlier point of this group of people that I'm surrounded by with with Harris and the Weinstein's and and uh, and Peterson and everybody else and you, I included that. These are really great intellects and. Look, I'm I'm a comic. I was a poli sci major, but I'm a, I'm a comic and I'm a, a talker, and I you know I, I like to think about these issues, but I don't think my place is to necessarily uh, be the hardcore intellect. Not that I can't do it, but I, I'm not a trained you know sure. biologist, let's say, or neuroscientist or something. But I come more from from your school, which is I want to connect with these people. Mm-hmm. I want to understand these ideas. I think the thing that I'm probably best at is distilling some of these really complex ideas into language that that mm-hmm. regular people can understand because I consider myself a regular person and when I sit there with Eric Weinstein who rifles off five math- mathematical theories that I can't even pronounce <laughs> well if I can get one of them into something that makes some sense for people that they can use you know one of the greatest minds of our generation you know, he's using a mathematical theory to explain something that's happening on social media, you know, a trend related to speech and everything. And he's going, there's a reason for this. There's a mathematical certainty reason for this. And he, and he does this. He's done this repeatedly on my show. If I can get a couple of people to understand that a little bit better and it cleans up their thinking a little, it's awesome. It's powerful. It's real. Um, <clears throat> Diane Sawyer. You know Diane Sawyer. Of course, of course. Uh, Diane Sawyer. I said I'm 42, not not, not 22, you know. Uh, she invited me to lunch one day when I was at CNN before I went to the evil empire. <laughs> and, uh, Depends which uh, side know. of evil I you're know. on, you know. And, uh, and she invited me to lunch, and I was, I was about your age, and I was on tour, and I, I, I mean, I just was not stopping. And I came in, and the first thing I noticed, she wasn't in stage makeup and TV makeup, so she, she looked tired. Mm-hmm. And I must have looked exactly the same because I sat down and she said, you look tired. And I said, I don't know how to do this. I, don't, I am so tired. And she said, oh, you have to look at it differently. And I would give you the same advice. She said, you will come home every day if you can come home. And when you're finished with the day, you will be bone tired. And I Mm. remember bone tired because that's the way I felt. My bones hurt. I was so tired. And she said, you will be bone tired. But in exchange, you will get to witness and see things that no one else sees. And you're just in that part of your life that is just, you're, you're a witness. That's why I asked you if you kept a diary. You're yeah. a witness to something that nobody else gets to see. It's weird. You know, it's, I've never had it sort of explained that kind of clearly to me, but it is weird. I, I'm tacitly, or maybe not tacitly is probably not the right word, I'm subtly, I guess, aware of that behind myself, sort of. Like, there are moments when I'm on stage, and, you know, whether I'm with Peterson or doing mm-hmm. stand-up, and I'm, I'm really... I'm doing my best to say something that is true that I believe. Or in stand-up, sometimes it's like you're saying something that's mostly true and trying to make people laugh at the same time, you know. Um, but then when I see the way people react to me after and want to share their stories with me and all of these things, it's like it, it, it definitely, I can tell you this, I'm a better person even right this second than I was four months ago than when we started this tour. Because not only because of sort of just being around Jordan, who I think is is as close to consistently saying something true as anyone I can really mm. imagine on earth. He is trying so freaking hard using all of the incredible tools that he has attained. He is so slow in his speech. And people have said to me, he's so, so slow. No, he's exact. He's weighing every word to make sure it's right. He is so responsible. One of the analogies that he uses about the way he approaches these talks, and I, I love this, because this is where he'll, he can take a very complex idea and get it into something that, are, that you can just, that a regular person can understand. He'll say, well, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking through an idea on stage, you're watching me do it. I want to get it to the edge of where my intellect can get it, and then I have to sort of put it down so I don't, you know, just completely lose it right in front of you. And he likens that to his daughter climbing the tree in front of their house when she was young, that he would watch her. She could get to a certain branch 
And then, you know, a, cu- she'd, a couple of times put her leg over, or try to reach, try to reach, couldn't do it. But then a couple of days later, could get a little bit further and a little bit further. And before he knew it, she was at the top of the tree. And I see him doing this. I genuinely see it. The guy's doing hour and a half lectures that are different basically every... I mean, I haven't heard the same one twice. I mean, you know, sometimes there's some themes, obviously, that are similar. You know, I'm sure the, I'm sure the publisher would be happier if he was just talking about the book the whole time. But he's using this to expand his knowledge. And I think, and I've never seen him, I've never seen him lie or say something that he doesn't believe or intentionally mislead the audience or anything like that. Really, I've never seen it. I've seen him, uh, you know, if I, if during the Q&A when I ask him something that maybe he doesn't want to fully address at the moment, um, he'll say it. He doesn't, you know, I mean, you know what it's like, all these people that get on TV all the time and they have an answer for everything Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they know everything and, you know, you're never going to see a real human there. I see presence and human with him all the time. So I think I'm better from that just in these last couple of months. I still got a long way to go. It's a work in progress every day, right? None of, none of us, I I don't know anyone that's, that's fully there, but I know some people. you stop working, you die. Yeah, you're done, right? That's it. So it's like. I want to keep working. I want to keep being on the adventure, but also knowing that that people think that I've done something good here just because I just started saying what I think. That's all I did. So to get back to the original question, I just, I was a lefty. I was one of these people and I saw something early on that now pretty much everyone sees. I mean, everyone, whether you're conservative, libertarian, you're an old school liberal, even most of the progressives, I think, actually see it now that there is this truly horrific authoritarian strain that has just uh, encompassed the the modern left. And I mean that from the academic perspective to the media, to the political establishment. It has just infected everything. And for some reason, I was one of the first people that saw it. And I tried the best I could as an insider to say, let's wake up or it's going to lead to really terrible things, not only within our party, but within the other guys. You will get Trump, the guy you think is a Nazi and all of these things. And guess what? He's not the Nazi. And then you won't be able to see the Nazi when the Nazi comes because the Nazi might be you. And I think that's a lot closer, although I don't mm-hmm. like playing those, yeah, those word know. games, of course. Um, and all I did was tell my story. And because of that, an awful lot of people suddenly, I guess, were in the recesses of their mind thinking similar thoughts, and, and now they're on that journey with me. Uh, you don't, I don't think, I don't think people are born brave. Um, I don't think people, in fact, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's anybody in history, unless they were insane, <laughs> that did something great that wasn't terrified. They Mm -hmm. just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a muscle. And unless you've had to exercise that muscle on smaller things all throughout your life, you're just not going to do it. Yeah. Let me start early with you as a kid. Yeah. First time you thought, I'm different. Well, I, if if this is sort of leading to something about sexuality, is that kind of where you're trying yeah. to go with this? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I probably maybe around. 30. I mean, unless there was some other thing yeah. that would have been different that would have. Oh. Went, oh no! Wait, wait! I don't know what this is. Well, no. I mean, I always. I think I. You know, it's so funny. People say, "Oh, I always thought I was different," and then everyone says it, and then it's like, "Well, we all couldn't have been <laughs> yeah, different." Right, you know, right. what are we? So I was always sort. You know, I was always kind of funny and quippy, even when I was in kindergarten. You know, I was always like sort of the. the I wasn't the class clown, but I was kind of in the back, like making fun of the class clown, or like. So I always saw the world a little bit differently. Now that may be a precursor to, uh, to talking about sexuality a little bit. I would suppose maybe around third or fourth grade, something like that. But I would say in a, in a more. When uh, what I'm looking for is. Um, the first time you thought, I, th- I'm different and yeah. this is a bit scary. Yeah. So that I think probably around 10th grade or something. And I don't even know that I've ever talked about this publicly before. I remember thinking that 
like I seemed to be attracted to guys, but I didn't think I was I didn't think I was gay. Gay was like you like show tunes and you like dancing. <laughs> I mean that's then really I'm gay. They, right, that you're gay. Well that's that that's the funny thing. I mean people say this to yeah, me all the time. People say to me, You don't seem gay. What and it's is like that? well what do you what do you really say? Like, mm-hmm. you know, there's pretty mm-hmm. much one thing that makes you gay and mm-hmm. then everything else is is something mm-hmm. else. But I still don't really like theater and I'm a horrible dancer. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd and I'd much rather play basketball and video games or whatever. Right. But I assure you, I'm gay. You know right. what I mean? Like, so I so that's what made me feel weird. I think because I didn't act the way you were supposed to act if you were gay. And I think there's a lot more people like this than than we see at sure. all. Because we still sort of do even now for all the progress that's been made. And I say progress in the in the true sense of progress. Yeah. Um, mostly what you get on television or in mainstream media from uh, gay people is still sort of a minstrel show. You can get a lot of them on Bravo talking about fashion, or you can get some over the top you know, sort of clown on some other show or there are whatever, people but it like, is, there are people like that. Sure. And yeah. I don't begrudge them. Yeah, if yeah, if yeah. anything, there was a time in my life where in a weird way, I was actually jealous of them because I thought, whoa, you so are who you are. And it's just out there. While I kind of felt like a freak because people would say, even after I came out and people would say, we well, don't seem gay. <laughs> and I, and they meant it as a compliment. That's really what they meant. They meant you seem normal. But I didn't feel normal. So the more people tell you you're normal and you don't feel normal, that's when you really start feeling crazy. So it was like this really odd. So I don't want to compare the two at all, but I'm an alcoholic, but I had certain rules. I wouldn't drink until 5 p.m., but I would stand at a place at (laughs) 5 and I would literally I would watch the second hand because I was not an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Alcoholics are drunk. They're all day long. And so it's a weird thing because you're convinced. No, no, that's not that's not me. Yeah. Is it kind of like that? It is kind of like that. It really is kind of like that. You know, one of my policies when I so I actually I don't know that I've ever I think maybe I've said this once or twice, but I, the first night that I ever came out to someone, believe it or not, was uh, 9, 10, September 10th, 2001, 2001 at about 1130 p.m., in the Times Square subway station. I told my friend Mike Singer, who was a comedian, uh, he was gay, actually. And he was the first person I ever came out to. And then, and he didn't really realize that it was like something major for me. He, he thought I was just telling him like, I'm gay, you know, like yeah. zippity doo dah, right. whatever. And we separated, he went to Queens. I went back to the Upper West Side, uh, uh, Upper East Side at the time. And, uh, and I woke up the next morning and obviously the world had changed. And I remember, I mean, this is what being closeted is sort of like. It's an inside job. The reason they call it is the closet is there's only room for one in there. And when you are that isolated and that disconnected and not being real with, with your reality and not being truthful, you, you become paranoid, you become duplicitous. I, I could lie like that, not even that I was trying to lie. People would say, well, wh- wh- you know, who are you dating? Or what you? And it's like you could just come up with a lie. It wasn't, I wasn't walking around thinking I'm going to lie to people all the time, but lies, and that, that probably is, yeah, that's probably very similar to alcoholism yeah. or, or abusing a drug or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I remember I woke up the next morning, and I know this sounds completely insane. I was also smoking a lot of pot at the time. I woke up the next morning, and I honestly thought it had something to do with what I said. That, um, that I truly thought that. Shut up. Yeah, I truly thought that. That's how sort of twisted the world had become to me. Like, you, you, because when you, when you are so cut off from reality. Was that a religious thing? Or what, what, what? Where did that come from? You thought the. I thought I had had this horrible, horrible secret for so long, and I finally said it. I finally actually said it. I released it into reality. And then I woke up the next morning in the city that I lived in. How long did it take before that went away? <sighs> Probably, I mean, I think at some point over the next couple of days, then the, the true nature of the reality of what was happening with 9 11. Gosh, that must have made it uh, a thousand times worse. I mean, I can't imagine that, you know, anything yeah. that would make it a thousand times worse. But, but you know, within, within an hour of, or maybe two hours of the attack, I was on, I lived on 90th and 1st. So if you know Manhattan, I mean, that's really the polar opposite of where the towers were. And, you know, within two hours, the, the smell and oh, yeah. the soot and the, and the air. And then, you know, I had friends that couldn't get out of the city that stayed with me. And my grandma actually lived in Manhattan. My dad couldn't get out of the city, stayed with her and some of his coworkers and just all that chaos. So I think I probably broke out of that paranoia yeah. quickly. But I mean, it was a real thought in my mind for a little while but that's what happens i think when when you are so closed off to reality 
And you can't deny your truth. I mean, you know, I didn't, I'm pretty sure I'm not the guy who came up with the truth yeah. will set you free, but you, you can't. You can't deny your nature. You can, you, can, you can be the best person you can be, and you can always work at that. But So my favorite uh, line is not the truth shall set you free. It's, and I don't remember who said this first, the truth shall set you free but it might make you miserable first. <laughs> Most likely it will. Yeah. yeah. So when you started, how did your parents take it? Did you? So I, I was still, so what I did was, so after that, I thought my policy, I, despite this psychotic and really paranoid thought that, you know, yeah. the world was ending right, because right, of right. me. I mean, it's, I'm not, you know, I'm really not it's kidding amazing. when I say this. It really was. After I got past that, my policy was if I, tell one person and I feel better then I'll tell someone else. And that's what I did for the course of like two years. And by the way, in, in uh, 2001, I was already 25, 26. So I was not a young person relative to figuring out who you are. And I regret, the, you know, not, I don't have regret in that I know I'm here now and I'm supposed to be here now. Um, but I know I did a lot of undue damage psychologically to myself and, and probably physically at some level. And I did drugs and, and all sorts of things because I was coping the way anyone, yeah. anyone would cope. So my policy was if I tell one person and I feel better, then I'll know that that's sort of the right path. And what I would do is I would tell one person I'd feel better for a little while and then I would start feeling worse again because I needed to tell someone. And then when it would get to the breaking point again, I would tell someone else. And the more people I told, what I realized was the, the, the time before I'd feel bad would start getting shorter and shorter because the more reality I stepped into, the less I could tolerate mm -hmm. the, 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 lie. The, the lie. And so that, that was, it was like I was testing myself in a way. I was testing, well, I don't feel gay, whatever that means, or the world doesn't see the person that I am as, as this thing. And I was doing a little test on my own. And, uh, you know, it's not even something that I talk about a lot or think about a lot that much anymore because I just am. I, I just am here. And uh, the back to the what my dad said, I am. I mean, that's really a complete sentence by itself. You know, it can be followed by something. But when you are whole, that's all it needs to be said. Yeah. I am. I would say the the piece that I do think about is that you know, you always know yourself, like no matter how good or whole uh, Glenn Beck might be in 2018, you know the guy that was standing there at the bar counting those minutes down. And mm -hmm. I know the sort of damaged person that I was mm -hmm. for a while. I don't dwell on it. I don't. I'm too busy to dwell on mm -hmm. it now, which is nice, right? Like yeah. it's like I'm doing something right now. So I don't. But some of the vestiges of that still haunt you, haunt me at least. And I don't know that you fully can ever escape that and maybe there's a reason for that maybe there's a fuel in that that you need as a as a either a creative person or just a, an aware person uh, as a as a christian you know we believe in the atonement we believe in forgiveness and so if you really accept that and you can give that to whatever um but it does change you because uh, it was when i was uh you know 30 i was completely out of control and uh, I just, I couldn't live this way anymore. And I couldn't live with the mistakes that I'd made. They were just crushing. And um, uh, you could look at this as a spiritual thing or a mental thing. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but when I finally made the, I took the step and said, this is what I believe. And this, I'm going to give this package to him, and he's going to take it, and I'm not going to do it. That's why I don't understand well why, why people argue about religion. Does it work for you? Yeah. If it works for it. you? I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. But I had blinding, crippling migraines twice a week, and I know it was just from the mental beating inside. Mm -hmm. The day I made that commitment, last migraine I had, I mean, it, and I had them for years. And you can give it away, but it's almost, I think, 
it's a constant renewal of let it go. Let it go. Yeah. I think hell is not being able to forgive yourself. Not being able to put your past in the past. Well, think how powerful that is. I mean, that, so that's like saying, well, hell is here and heaven can be here too. Right. If you line this stuff up correctly, whatever your mission is here, and you do it forthrightly and honestly and treat people well and, and tr- truly do the best you can, which we all fail at all the time, every single day. Like if you don't think you do, then you probably do more than, more than most, right? Yeah. So if you do that, then you could be, then heaven could be right here. Because otherwise, what, what's better than what you can imagine? It can all be right here. It doesn't mean you're going to have 50 million bucks tomorrow and, yep. you know, and on but this. But that's not. But that's not. That's not it. That's not it. So anything that I think that we can imagine as human beings can happen here and now. Yes. And if you really believe that, if you really strive to achieve that, I think you have a pretty decent chance at it. You might not. <laughs> And you might screw it up, right? You might get it for, I think what you probably, I think probably at the, at the end, if, if you all, if everyone goes across a life that's a full healthy life to 90, let's say, I suspect that the people that, that do this the best, that live the truest, most honest, decent life possible, I suspect there's very few people that live in that place of heaven for a long time. You kind of can dip, you can dip in in and and out. out. You can dip in and out and you might have a run. You know, it's like you can look back on your life. I can think of certain moments in my Mm -hmm. life, certain summers or whatever it was. I was Mm -hmm. like, man, that was good. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was on it. I was Mm -hmm. was there. I was present. I was, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever it was, whatever I was doing. You know, like I can even think back when I was doing stand-up and like I, even though I was, a lot of my repression was what was leading me to be on stage, right? Like I was, that's the interesting thing, actually. I, it really fueled a lot of good comedy when I was younger because- Pain usually does. Because pain does, but then, you know, I heard George Carlin say this, um, and I love this. It's like, you gotta have a certain amount of pain to be a comic, but then at some point, you better own that pain and get rid of it, otherwise it'll destroy you. And, mm-hmm. and again, there's a great analogy to an alcoholic here. Mm-hmm. It's like, you, you may need it for a while, or you may have a good time on alcohol for a while, it will not last forever. And I think this is why so many great comics die of drug overdoses or alcoholism or, or otherwise do all sorts of crazy things because they never get to the point where the pain is secondary because they need the fix to be funny. And I definitely remember thinking that my life was sort of like, a, it was like two tracks that weren't lined up sort of. So like I was really on a good career track, but my life was miserable yeah. and I was alone and I was lying and all sorts of stuff. And now my life is pretty, you know, it's pretty close. And there'll be moments when it's disjointed again. And hopefully I'm just aware enough to to get it lined up when it needs to be. Tell me, tell me what it is. Tell me the moment that is crystallized in your head of, this is hell not being me. Not yeah, I know it for me. sure. For sure. The moment that I remember that I sort of hit rock bottom, so to speak. I remember, so I lived on 90th and 1st, and if you know the New York subways a little bit, the closest subway is 86th and Lex. That's a pretty far walk for a subway because you got to go 89th, 88th, 87th, then you got to go 1st to 2nd to 3rd to Lex. Mm-hmm. New York City time, that's a mm-hmm. big walk. Rain nor sleet nor snow. I was working, I was doing stand-ups at, uh, stand-up at night, but I was working just some job at a, I don't even, I honestly don't even really remember what it was. I had some desk job, really, I think at a PR company or something. Mm. I, have, I have almost no recollection of it, really, Maybe. because I was so disconnected from my reality that there's a certain, wow. there really is a certain part of, my husband David, he's name, same name as me, it's amazing, people go crazy, uh, he asks me often about my early 20s, and I always say I can't really remember because I think my day-to-day life was so disconnected from whatever was going on in my head that I can't really, like I have a vague recollection of the office, but I don't really remember what I was doing or wow. any, yeah, like truly. That so, wasn't that long ago. It's not that long ago. I mean, this is, this is you know, 20, and it's not that long ago, 20 yeah. years or something. This isn't, 80, you know, 70 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, I remember walking that commute one day to just to get to the subway station in the morning. And I'm walking down the street and everything was shaking. The buildings were shaking. The street was shaking like an earthquake, like this around my head. But I was still, 
So I was walking and I felt still on the street, but the entire, it felt like the entire world was, was shaking, not spinning like this. It was shaking like this, like this, like a globe that you were like doing this. And that's when I, re I remember this for sure. I haven't thought of this in a long time. I remember this. Like, I was like, whoa, I have got to fix this. Like, that's when I finally was like, something is not right here. And, and it is, it's what you said before. It's like when your reality is so disconnected from real reality, man, your world will shake. You will, you will do things you, you shouldn't do. You will act out in all kinds of crazy ways. But that, for me, I guess that was really the rock bottom moment that then I started getting a little bit of it back. Ooh, forgot about that. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? It's, yeah. good, it's good to go, you know, because some of this also is the more you talk about this, I don't talk about it that often, but that is how you get some closure on some of this stuff. And it, and it, it is. It renews some of the things that, wow, how did I get here now? Why am I tolerant of, of a, other opinions? It's amazing to me. I, I remember at the time I said the worst thing about me. Somebody had called up, and at the time I was on radio. I'd been done radio for, I don't know, 25 years. And... Uh, and had a big audience, and I was in Mr. Goody Two Shoes. I was known as this, you know, clean cut yep. guy. My marriage was a wreck. I was an alcoholic, and somebody, I was, I was trying to clean up my life, and I had stopped drinking, but I wasn't sober yet. And um, somebody had called in on this morning show, and uh, said, you know, Glenn Beck, you know. You might have the perfect life, blah, blah, blah. That's all I heard. You might have the perfect life. And I don't even know what they said. And I stopped and I said, you know, let me tell you something. Nobody here knows who I really am. And the room just stopped. And everybody was like, oh, dear God, play a record, man. <laughs> right. And, uh, the bat phone goes yeah, off. Cut him I, out. I said, uh, let me tell you who I am. And I just bore my soul. And I turned off the mic and I looked at Steve Stu, my pro now still my producer. He was an intern at the time. Turned off the mic and I said, well, write this day down. This is the day Glenn <laughs> Beck destroyed his career. The opposite happened. Yeah. It's so empowering because you have lived with this secret and it's destroyed you. And you just want to say, this is who I am, and I'm struggling, and I'm, you know, I am vulnerable here. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all these people would, would come up to me, or in the days when we still wrote letters, would write and say, I can't believe you said that. That's exactly how I feel. This is exactly what I'm going through. And it's amazing to me how... It's why I believe when somebody says, you know what? Don't read that. That's the first thing I read. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Don't think that. Don't talk to that person. That is so damaging mm -hmm. because when you keep that secret, you're not only crushing yourself, everyone around you has their own secret, you're whatever actually, it is. You're actually crushing the nature of reality. You are. I really believe that. The more that you operate in some sort of alternate reality because of your own crap, whatever that crap might be, and however you act out because of that crap. Well, that's just what everyone's doing. Every, we're all doing it to different levels. So maybe as the two of us sit here right now, we're doing the, th the game a little bit better than, than we used to, let's say, <laughs> right? Like something like that, right? Of course, not to say we don't have struggles and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. deficiencies and all of those things, of course. But if everyone's doing that at some level, well, then the reality that we're all co-building together becomes this really strange, tenuous thing. And I think that that's really where we're at right now. It's, we sit online yes. all day long. We sit online all day long yelling at people and, and pretending as if we've got all the answers. You know, all of these writers at all of these ridiculous publications. It's like you people, mo none of you have created anything. Uh, you know, I got into it once with, um, you know, Jonathan Chait at, uh, is it New Yorker magazine or New York magazine? Okay, I don't even, I don't even like mentioning names because I try to talk fine, about, yeah. I try to talk about, uh, ideas, ideas instead people. of people, but, but he's either at New Yorker or, or New York Magazine, 
And he said something to the effect of, on Twitter, something about how small business, the phrase small business, is just a Republican uh, catchphrase. It's no, no small business really exists. It's just a way that they trick you into being for big business. Some, some, oh something to, something yeah. to that effect. Right. And I, wrote, I retweeted him, and I wrote back, well, Jonathan, just FYI, I, I have a small business with a couple employees, and I'm very proud of what we've built here, and I think you're wrong about this. I mean, I did it pretty respectfully, not mm-hmm. on the attack. Mm-hmm. And then he wrote back immediately and he said, see, a couple employees. And I thought, this is, this is pretty interesting. I have a couple employees. I've built a company that I'm incredibly proud of. We pay all the benefits, mm-hmm. 100% for all of our employees. We're growing a little bit right now, but we're doing it within our means. All the in ideas. In California. In California, yeah. I'm a crazy person, yeah. right? Um, I may move in with you, by the way. We'll, <laughs> yeah, get, we'll get to that at the end. Listen, but, uh, did you go to a soup kitchen at night? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but he mocked the idea of a couple. And I thought, this is really interesting. So you guys, you hate big business. Now you have somebody saying, I'm a small business. Now you're mocking them. So what is your reality that's right for you? I know that mm-hmm. I've employed people. I'm suspecting he never has. He works mm-hmm. at a giant company for a, mm-hmm. a lot of money. And it's like, well, if I had 16 employees, would that be the number that now you're okay with? Right. Because I know if I had 100 employees, you'd say I'm big business and I'm bad. I have a couple, so I'm small business and I don't exist. What's the number for you, person who's created nothing? You know, you write some things, but do you do? I don't know. Maybe, again, I don't want to make this too much about yeah, things I know. I know. specifically. But I relate this back to, to what we're talking about, that it's like we're all playing these imaginary um, intellectual games that somehow we know what is best for everyone. And if only we could control everything, everyone would be okay. And that's actually pretty tyrannical and, and not very... horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally yeah. fascistic. Um, but does it, does it come from arrogance or fear or both? I mean, we're, we're all watching Facebook. I, I mean, come on. You look at Facebook and the pictures. I, my, my pictures on my Facebook. I, I post pictures of me. My favorite pictures of me are when I get up in the, air, in the morning and my hair is standing yeah. straight up. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because right, right, right. that's what's real. Yeah. But you look on Facebook. You look on we're all everything it. is fake. You, you take a picture now and you color adjust, you color correct, you make sure that, no, that that product is there or this cup is there or my favorite blanket is there. It's crazy. It's crazy. No one is reflecting actual real life. Yeah. Well, this is why I try to take these breaks, because you really, especially if you do what we do, where people really are paying attention. It's not just like I'm taking a picture of food and my five friends are commenting on it or something like that. I mean, we're, we're really trying to engage in ideas in an honest way. So people really do care about what we say. And yet there are moments where even I, as someone that's really aware of this, and I try to take the weekends off, and as you know, I did the, the August off the grid thing and all that, I still get caught up in the madness of it all. Or, or I'll be on Instagram, and if I took a picture of my ice cream cone, I suddenly f- realize it's five minutes later, and I just adjusted the color of the mint chocolate mm-hmm. chip, and I'm like, what the hell did I just do? Right. You know, what did I just right. do? That's a mint chocolate chip. It's usually a very nice green. You feel right. good about it. It's like, this doesn't right. need to be colored anymore or right. saturated or structured right. or whatever. So we're all doing all of these things, and this is what I mean. We, we're not giving ourselves the space to just kind of be anymore, and, but it's to ourselves. We're all doing it to ourselves. But I think there's going to be a big anti-technology movement building. I mean, I think there's, there's the roots of it mean? now. Well, I think there's, a, there's now camps for adults where there are anti-technology camps that are springing up all over the place, and you can, t- you know, technology. Not anti-technology, technology. Uh, uh, a, resp- a, a a balancing of technology. Well, I think the camps are designed to really get you off the devices and be right, present right, and right, yo- right. do yeah, yoga yeah, yeah, and yeah. meditation okay. and things like that. But it's not like technology is bad. Well, I think eventually we'll get to some of that. I mean, I think there will be really, there will be radical anti-technology people, really. There will be. I'm sure there are some will you now. Be? No, I don't think yeah. I will be because... Because everything that humans have created can be good and it can be bad. Everything we've ever created. We split the atom. We make clean energy yep. and we blow things up. We learned quickly. Let's not blow things up. Yeah, but you know what? We've used them. Yes. And they will be used again. Correct. And anything that we create, anything that humans can do, I mean, that, that's the irony. It's like, you know, you see people that are either for themselves or against themselves or all of these things. And it's like... 
if something can be done, it will be done. Yes. So I don't believe in just stopping things because of the potential for evil, because it's going to happen. And, well, and okay, you, don't so wa- you don't want to just, I would say, you don't want to just, if all the good people stop because of all the potential bad things, well, then you're just going to leave it to all the bad people who are going to do all sorts of awful things. Right. And, like, and, for instance, yeah. I do not want the federal government to have AI. <laughs> yeah. I don't want them to have yeah. I don't want Google to have it. Well, I hate but to tell I you, the don't. ship has sailed, I my know. friend. Uh, no, I mean AGI. Uh, yeah. I don't, <laughs> but I don't want, I certainly do not want China to have it or Russia to have it. Yeah. So you're kind of sitting here and you're like, okay, well, so we better. But what if the ship already do... sailed? I mean, truly already sailed. I don't mean it just metaphorically. I mean, what if, well, it's still a metaphor, but no, I mean, already... what, if, what if it really has happened already? Because I am starting to think that that might be where we're at. That these algorithms now, you know, the people that came up with the Google algorithms that now control so much of our information, a lot of them aren't even there anymore. Right, and, right, right. So, yeah. so, that, so we have AI. Are you familiar yeah. with AI, A-G-I, A-S-I? What's A-S-I? Okay, so artificial intelligence we have. Yeah. Okay? Um, and artificial intelligence is good at one thing. So I can sort through Facebook and I can find these things. I can play chess and beat any human. I can do je- play Jeopardy, and I can beat you. I can look at uh, 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 cancer uh, tests, and I can diagnose it, fa- diagnose it better than any human. Yeah. That's AI, but it can only do one of those things. It cannot do general things. It can't be good at many things. Mm-hmm. So we have AI. The next step is AGI. When we hit AGI, the world completely changes. What does the G stand for? General. Okay. Artificial general intelligence. That will work like the human brain, so it can do everything. Mm -hmm. When it gets into AGI, the next step is ASI. That could be an hour in the transition. It could never happen. We don't know. And the S is? Super intelligence. That puts us in a position of, it has been described as... We are a fly yeah. on a plate in a kitchen. That fly has absolutely no idea that's a plate, that's a kitchen, and what those people are even, what they are, let alone what they're talking about. We are the fly. ASI are the people. Okay? That, you know, some people say 2040, 2050. Uh, Ray Kurzweil say, says we will get to AGI by 2028, I believe. You haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. And the problem is, is that you, you should never fear the technology. You have to fear the goal mm-hmm. of the technology. Because when it hits AGI, and especially AI, whatever its goal is, it will accomplish it. Okay? It, 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 it will accomplish it. Well, that's why the... Right now, if you were to just take this into where we're at now, when you see the James Damore memo at Google and you see the way social justice and this, di- this faux diversity yes. has, been, uh, has been injected into the algorithm. I mean, we know this. Yes. We know the yes. way search results are manipulated. Yes. So we actually are now manipulating truth in the name of diversity. Correct. This is, so now, Correct. so if you just play along now with these next Correct. two phases that you've mentioned here, eventually this AI... If it has been manipulated properly, properly by by the bad people, the way yeah. they want it manipulated, there's going to be an awful lot of people that that AI is going to turn against. Oh my gosh! And, uh, yeah, so I mean now already, we're now we're in every dystopian so movie ever, right? It's already happened. They did a study um, on um, releasing people from prison. Okay, how do we tell who should be on parole or not? So they fed all of this information into AI, um, and it's just cold and calculated. And so what it did is it spat out who should go uh, uh, on prison release and who should not. Well, they did it for a while. Everything was working out until somebody noticed, wait a minute, this is letting more white people out Mm -hmm. than black. So then the scientist said, is the AI racist? Wait, well, if you programmed it to take in race, perhaps. But if you took it in to look at just these numbers, so what did they do? They adjusted it. So they, they unbiased it. They unbiased it, they it yeah. which was the bias. <laughs> right. You right. have to define. 
we are in a place where nobody knows what any word means anymore. We don't know what it means to be a racist. We don't know. When people say a safe zone, it drives me out of my mind. You are safe. You're uncomfortable. Yeah. There's a huge difference. What we are programming right now is only going to get worse because it will just, it's the baseline and it keeps building on that. So what I would say, the, the saving grace, because when we go down this rabbit hole of a conversation, people start freaking out and I know guys like us are going to think about this all the time and worry about it and okay, fine, we can, we can be the uh, canary in the coal mine, all that. The saving grace is that I believe that this, this social justice idea and these terrible ideas of diversity and unbiasing where you're actually, you're then putting in systemic yes. bias. So if, you know, the, the, the one that everyone talks about is that if you search um, something like American scientist um, or famous American scientist, yes. you now get a disproportionate amount of black scientists. Right. Now nobody is saying there aren't black scientists or shouldn't be black scientists, of course. But if you were to search famous American scientists, most of them would be white. Now, we can discuss all sorts of reasons why yeah, that yeah. is, but it is just the truth. Now, what you realize is that the, all of these, these trickeries that all of these, that the AI is doing and that these people are putting into the system, they can't stand forever. I, be, I honestly believe, and this is why I think that, that the individual can win mm -hmm. still ultimately, yes. is that it will, it will destroy these companies. If Google says, you know, we're not going to hire Asian engineers anymore because we're, they're disproportionately represented at our company and, and, and in the engineering field. Well, then what you're going to say is, well, first off, you're now putting in systemic racism, there, right? There's no systemic racism that's stopping anyone from any color working anywhere. If you now, as a company, Google say, well, we can't have Asian, Asian engineers here because we want to be more diverse, you're actually injecting systemic because now it's in the system. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, not, not a law at Google, but it's part of your company policy. Now it's systemic. Ultimately, what that will do, and I mean this not just at Google, but at every place that buys into these ideas of this faux diversity, they will start hiring worse people, not because these people are minorities or, or gay or transgendered or whatever they are in a wheelchair or whatever they are, but because you will not be taking the best of the best and forcing people to strive to be the best of the best. You will be taking people for lesser reasons. And ultimately, over time, that means your company will start faltering because there will be someone out there who is smart enough to go, this is nonsense and I'm going to fight for a better thing. So that's a little bit different than totally fighting the AI and the yeah. evolution of all of yeah. that. But that's still where humans can make a difference. Stop buying into this nonsense because it will, it will come for everyone. Okay. We're at the end of well, I have to, last question. Yeah. End of your life. Uh oh, you're because of, because of AI's life-saving <laughs> technology, you're 300 years old. Oh, geez. Uh, and uh, you're thinking back. What do you hope you will fill that blank in after I am at that moment? say I am okay I hope at the end wherever that end is whether it's 86 or you know 329 386. yeah that that does sound quite horrific whether yeah. I'm just a you know a head in a jar yeah if it's if it's 386 it would be I'm tired yeah I'm, I'm really <laughs> exhausted I think I'm okay that that whatever it is that I did here that at the end that I felt okay with whatever I created, whatever, whether, whether I have kids or don't have kids, whether I, uh, whether, whether nothing, where they're all the things that we've talked about here, whether I'm irrelevant in a year for some reason, or whether this is just the beginning. Again, I always feel like I'm at the beginning. Um, I hope that at the end I'll go, I did everything I could do. I really did, you know, within the constraints of, being a human, I, I did everything that I possibly could do. I, I had a good friend, my best childhood friend since I'm four years old. I remember the day we met in kindergarten, literally. Uh, we've, been, we've been best friends for now almost 40 years. Um, his father died suddenly last week. His dad's 80 years old. He had a heart attack in the middle of the night. He was, he was dead two days later. He had uh, 
four great sons, whole bunch of grandchildren, been married, I think, 60 years. Really good man. I can only picture this guy smiling every time I went over to my buddy John's house. Dad was there having a great time with us and messing with us and, you know, was a good father, obviously a good grandfather and everything. And I went to the, I went to the funeral last week and, you know, people were crying, but they were also laughing and, and all of the things that happened and the feeling that I walked away with. I hadn't seen his dad in probably about 10 years, but the feeling I walked away with was that was a life that was full. And I think that's all you can want, that you did something, you know, whatever it was, whether for him it was, you know, having kids and having grandkids and being around for everybody or whatever else he did in his life that I don't know about, that you just hope that you did something that was real and that at the end you go, all right, I did it and now let's see what happens after this. I think you can leave the stage. That's today. it saying that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. You bet. Thank you.